Hello and welcome to A Day in the Life. My name is Fred Hacker. I'll be your host and community producer. As we always do, we want to uh, thank our sponsors. This is the 110th program in this series, and we're very grateful to Bales Dishaw Wealth Management, who are our season sponsor. And this time, a bit of an anomaly, our sponsor is anonymous. And I must tell you that a friend of mine introduced me to our guest today and uh, then agreed under some duress to be the sponsor of this program, but asked to not be identified. And for those of you who are trying to guess who it is, this person does not live in the Midland area, but is a good friend of the Midland Cultural Center. I want to tell you about uh, an upcoming program that we have. The next uh, program we'll be doing will feature Gord Walker. Gordon Walker was an MPP. He was a cabinet minister and most recently was the Canadian chair of the International Joint Commission, which looks after water along the borders between Canada and the USA. So for those of you with an interest in water levels, you'll want to join us for our next program. Well, right now, I am delighted to introduce to you our guest for today. He is a Canadian. He is a public opinion pollster, an entrepreneur, a public speaker, an author, and an expert in political, business, and social trends. Welcome to you, Nick Nanos. Hey, Fred, it's great to join you and all your viewers. Thanks for being with us, Nick. And I must tell you that I really enjoyed getting to know you. And uh, I think this is going to be a fascinating program for our, uh, for our viewers. Nick, we normally begin by looking back at uh, the early days of our guests and looking at some of the influences that perhaps have led them to where they are today. So maybe you would tell us uh, about your uh, birthplace and, and your early life. Well, I was born in the great Ontario town of Trenton, Ontario, which is a small town in eastern Ontario. My parents uh, are both Greek. They uh, were born in Greece and they came to Canada. My dad right after the Second World War. And, uh, and then he went back, got his wife. It's like one of those typical stories, Fred. You know, go back to Greece, get your wife, and then return to Canada. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. With my dad. And then uh, I was born in, uh, in Trenton and uh and grew up so you know it's uh it was a it was a great start trenton was a great place to grow up in and uh still consider it my hometown nick you had a little bit of a different uh, early life uh linguistically yeah yeah so you might not know this by talking to me now but english is not my first language i was uh you know, because both my parents were Greek, you know, so my dad came to Canada, he didn't know how to speak English, and neither did my mother. So I grew up uh, speaking only Greek. I didn't learn English until I actually went to kindergarten at Dufferin Public School. And wow. you know what, Fred, I still remember my first day uh, in kindergarten, my, my kindergarten teacher was a wonderful woman named Mrs. Hemstreet. And uh, you can imagine Mrs. Hemstreet now has this like five-year-old Greek boy that doesn't know how to speak English. And, and obviously, Mrs. Hemstreet was pretty great. She didn't know how to speak Greek either. But, uh, you know, the thing is, is I remember the frustration of not being able to talk or for people to understand me because uh, I didn't know how to speak English. And that's all I remember on that day. Two things I remember. Her big, smiling, welcoming face, because you could tell she was trying her best to communicate with me. And the other thing that I remember that day was coming home and crying. I cried when I came home that very first day because I told my mother, in Greek, obviously, that uh, no one in the school understood me. I found I could, didn't know what to do and that it was very, very frustrating for me. So it was kind of a very, I think it's a very Canadian first day for a lot of new Canadians, at least. And uh, yeah, that's where it kind of all started off. But uh, as you can see, Fred, it kind of turned out okay for me. Good for you, Nick, and I think we'll find that out as we continue our conversation. What impact do you think uh, that early experience had on you in terms of your career and your life? Well, think of it this way. Whenever I bump into anyone that's a new Canadian or that struggles speaking English, I don't think of them, as, I think of them as like, this is like my mom or dad, Yeah. right? That, uh, you know, I and I think as a result, whenever I bump into a new Canadian or someone that's struggling with the language, 
um, I'm very respectful, right? I'm respectful and I, I you know, you, you can't but not have empathy because you are in that same place. Your family and many of your family members are in that same place where they come to another country to have a better life and then uh, and they, they struggle to communicate. So, so uh, I think that's, uh, so I think of my mom and dad whenever I bump into new Canadians because I said, you know what? My mom and dad came to Canada from another place to have a better life and uh, they're here to, uh, you know, trying their best and learning the language, but uh, that is still pretty difficult. Nick, you have a sibling. John, my brother John. Yes, and he's not far away from you. Yeah, well, uh, John's the uh, younger uh, Nano's brother, so there's just two of us, my brother John and I, and uh, he's, uh, he's based in Toronto, and he's got a wonderful family, and we are also business partners. We have That's been business nice. partners Wow, since the very beginning, and uh, we work together. But he's got his team in Toronto, and I'm in Ottawa. So, you know how siblings are sometimes. We have our space, but we uh, we're pretty tight, and we're very, very close. That's what I meant by him not being far away. He's been your business partner for a lot of years. <laughs> you uh, you were born and raised in in Trenton, and you went to public school there and began your high school career there. And then there was a tragedy in your life, Nick. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, my dad passed away. So he was a small business person. And uh, he uh, is it's a sad story because I, when he was 46, um, I remember him telling me, uh, you know, Nick, I've, I've made the money that I'd like to make in terms of living a comfortable living and I'd like to retire because he was a really, like a lot of people at that time, he was a very hardworking person. He worked in, he worked until like 11 o'clock every night in the, in the, my dad had a billiard parlor, national billiards right downtown Trenton. And uh, I remember him saying that he was going to retire. And I remember retiring for him. He talked about, I'd like to go fish. I'd like to have coffee with my friends. I'd like to spend time with my family. And uh, I remember, uh, I remember th the first little bit was actually pretty, pretty good for him. And then I, you could, I could see just as a kid, he was starting to get a little stressful. And then he very tragically just one day um, dropped dead of a heart attack. I was actually with him when he passed away, as was my brother, John. But, uh, you know, 13 year old, I'm 13 years old. My brother was eight years old and we're with our dad and he basically uh, drops dead of a heart attack. And that was a big, uh, that's a sad day. You know what? There isn't a day that passes that I don't think of him. Nick, I lost my father at almost exactly the same age. And, uh, and I'm always interested in talking to people who lost a parent early in life. What impact did it have on the way you viewed your own life? I wonder if it's the same as with me. Uh, well, I don't know if it's the same, but, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, my dad passed away when he was 47. And I kind of had this crazy thought that if I get past 47, every day past 47 is, is a day that is a bonus. So I never had any sense. It's like you benchmark yourself in the same way. You know, if my dad had lived to 80 or 90, I'd say I've got till 80 or 90. But when you hit that, you kind of realize that life is short and it, uh, it affected my view on life because it's kind of like every day, I don't hesitate to tell the people that I love that I love them. Yeah. Uh, I don't put off stuff. You know, my wife would say that I'm very compulsive. It's like, if there's an opportunity, I want to take it. If there's time to spend time together with your family, you don't say, oh, let's not get together for this Thanksgiving. We'll get together for next Thanksgiving. So there's a certain kind of family compulsiveness yes. and work compulsiveness that kind of drives you when you've had that kind of loss. Well, I very much relate to that because I decided I had to live my whole life before I was 45. And, uh, wow. Then one wondered what I'd do with the rest of the time. So, yeah, not, not unlike you. So the family moved after your father passed away. Yeah, yeah. You can imagine, you know, for my mom. And, you know, this goes back to, you know, so think I grew up. English is my second language. We're immigrants. We're different from other people in, in Trenton, although we were very, very welcomed. And then, and then all of a sudden we go to become a, I have a single, I'm, I'm raised by a single mom, which is very non-traditional in, in, in a lot of cultures. So, you know, I think, uh, I think for my mom, you know, who's still alive and uh, is doing well, um, it was pretty, it was pretty tough for her because she was like, I don't know, 33 years old. You can imagine being a widow or a widower at 33 years old with two little kids. And uh, yeah, we left. I, th I think it was just too tough to stay in the house. 
feels like haunted. Uh, so just one day, I don't even think we talked about it. She just said one day, she's got a job. It's in Oshawa. She's a manager of a women's clothing store. She, so she she's did a great job at that. And then one day we're in Trenton and then the next next day it seems we're in Oshawa, right? And, so you uh, continued your high too. school there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I went to O'Neill Collegiate and Vocational Institute, which is a great school right downtown. And, uh, but it was tough. So just think, you go to a new school. It's tough enough being a teenager, but then you go to a new school, it's hard to make friends. And, uh, but uh, Oshawa was another, I, I have a really soft spot for Oshawa as a, as a place to live. Nick, you, you thrived in high school and you had some successes in, in really disparate and interesting areas. Can you share that with us? Yeah, I guess it's a little eclectic. So you might not be surprised that I had uh, top marks in math and English, but I was also the poet laureate, which means I won the poetry contest, and the Euchre champion. Me and my friend, best friend were Euchre champions. So I kind of see that as kind of a bit of the trifecta, academic, Poetry and card playing, which <laughs> made me a little bit of a well-rounded uh, person. But uh, yeah, I don't, I not, and I don't even know why I entered the poetry contest, but I just felt uh, felt like writing poetry. It was actually the poet poem was about my dad, yeah. um, and uh, and I don't think I really had any expectation, but I just wanted, I just felt like doing it, and I was quite surprised to find out that I had won the poetry contest. So then you went off to university at Queen's. Uh, tell us about your undergraduate studies and also some of your uh, extracurricular pursuits. Queen's was, uh, Queen's was great. I, you know, Fred, I went to Queen's because, and, and maybe this is because of my personality, I thought Queen's was at that time, and I believe it was at that time, the best university for undergraduate in Canada. It was very competitive to get in. So for me, it was kind of like, what's the toughest school and the best school to go to? So at that time, it was Queens. And uh, my first degree was in uh, politics and economics. And I had some great props, like, you know, John Meisel, who was the chair of the CRTC, Ronald Watts, who was a constitutional expert and the principal of the school, and uh, had a great experience. And then I also dabbled in debating. Maybe it's my argumentative side. But so, uh, yeah, I was on the debating, was on, joined the Queens Debating Union. And uh, I will tell you, Fred, I was the self-proclaimed worst debater on the debating team and club. No one wanted to be my debating partner when I started, uh, but uh, I worked hard at it and I practiced. And then I went from being the worst guy on the team to one of the top guys on the Queens debating team and went to the national championships and on two occasions went to the world championships to represent Queens in Canada. And uh, it was a great... Uh, I really met some really interesting people from Canada, across the country, in the U.S. and around the world through the through the debating network. That was really just a, a, a blast. There's an interesting lesson in that, Nick, because a lot of people, if they were the worst member of the debating team, would drop out. That's not your way. No, it's kind of. Uh, but you know what? I, I recognize that, and for me, I I wanted to debate because I was interested in it. Yeah. And then it's like everything. You start with an interest and then you start to love something. And then if you start to love what you're doing, that's when you can really start to excel. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, uh, I just kept at it, but uh, I'll tell you, I, seriously, I would say for the first year, I was the butt of jokes, right? Like I think to pull a nanos might've actually been a debating term because it was so <laughs> sad. And, uh, but uh, over time, uh, uh, by the end of my debating career, no one was making fun of me or making any jokes. They were afraid. Uh, many, many of my competitors were afraid to, to draw me to, to be, a, be their opponent in a tournament by the end um, of the career. We've seen some of that in your professional life since then. <laughs> How was it about your graduate studies? Yeah, well, I got an MBA uh, from Queens at the business school, and the business school there is uh, top-notch. I quite liked the uh, Smith Business School. The, the props were excellent. The classes were great. Um, also got to feed a bit of my entrepreneurial spirit, and I learned a lot of great skills. And then uh, also, maybe, and I don't know whether this is good or bad, Fred, but uh, I have part of a PhD, which means I was uh, after, and this is only recently, I decided to, I'd always wanted to uh, have a PhD, although I think Dr. Nanos might sound more like a dentist 
than a than a social scientist. But anyways, that's a that's a different story. But always wanted to have a PhD. Uh, started uh, was accepted into the PhD program at Nottingham University uh, to study under Case uh, uh, Vander Dyke, who runs the European Election Study. Brilliant, wonderful man. Um, and uh, started doing my PhD and was, I think I was into year three or four and then uh, had to stop. I had got the, I was interrupted by Carleton University. Um, so, so yeah, so that was another thing. So I am not a doctor, uh, nor have I finished my PhD, but I have studied at the PhD level, but had to take a step back. You're probably the only PhD candidate who had to interrupt their studies in order to become the chairman of the board of a Canadian university. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just finished my term as the uh, chair of the board of governors at Carleton University, and I never yeah. really, uh, I served on the board. It's, it's a fantastic up and coming, I shouldn't say up and coming because it's just a fantastic school period with a fantastic spirit that's top notch. But uh, I was on the board and then uh, was invited to be the chair. Never really thought that would happen, but I was invited to be the chair. And, you know, Fred, I remember you make these decisions in life. So I'm doing my PhD, which I'm very, it's like a lifelong goal of mine to have a PhD. Um, I don't need a PhD to do work. It's not like I get a raise, but um, I do the, I, you know, I, I have this choice before me. It's like, do I finish my PhD? Uh, or do I take advantage of this opportunity to serve as a volunteer, the chair of the board of Carleton? Yeah. And I remember thinking about it for a while and just thinking, oh, you know what? Um, the PhD is for me. It's like a personal tick box. Um, there aren't going to be very many opportunities to serve the academic community in Carleton and place my, my, home, my new hometown of Ottawa. And it's an honor to be asked to be the chair of the board of governors. So, so I guess uh, I, I threw aside kind of my personal ambition to have a PhD, to be a volunteer on the board. And that was a, an exceptional experience Good for you. Um, leading a great team of people on a very strong board in a, in a super university. Nick, when you were still studying at Queens, you dipped your foot into what would become your future career. Can you tell us how that happened? Oh man, you know what? Luck counts. Luck counts in life, Fred. I I, uh, I was doing my undergraduate studies, and uh, one of my dad's friends was a local political candidate for the in the provincial election. He received a proposal to do a public opinion survey, and he I was thinking, you know, Jimmy's son Nick. I think he's studying this kind of stuff, so he calls me over for dinner, and I, I remember we have dinner, and then he has this proposal. And he slides the proposal across the table and says, "I got this proposal." It's for ten thousand dollars. It's to do a survey in the riding, provincial riding. Is this a good proposal? Is this what I should do? And uh, I read the proposal and I go, "Hey, you know, Uncle Tom. His name was Tom Annis, Tom Nagnostopoulos. I said, "Don't pay this consultant in Toronto. Pay me the ten thousand bucks. I'll do a better job." And then, of course, because I'm just a student, I start laughing, just uncontrollably laughing after I say that. And then he starts laughing, and then he goes, "Are you serious?" And I go, yeah. And uh, I did that project. And um, I remember after I did the project, he said, you know, I think you might be good at this. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm getting ready for law school. And uh, he said, I really think you might want to try this as a profession. And he rounded up a number of, uh, of investors to start the founding company that we started in 1987, SES Research. And, uh, and then uh, we kind of took off from there. It, it, it's, a, it's a great story to, to, to end up with a, a huge company and a big career out of a kind of a bit of a lark of a beginning. That's, hey, uh, listen, hey, Fred, my mother cried. I, remember, I still remember when I called to tell her I wasn't going to law school. And just think, I'm from a traditional family. Yeah. In my family, most of the people are entrepreneurs. They're small business people. They own convenience stores, restaurants, that kind of stuff, food distribution, real estate. Um, and I remember I, called, I had to call my mom to say, I'm not going to law school because I'd written the LSAT. I was intending to be a lawyer. And, I, and through all through high school, it was like, I want to be a lawyer. That's what I wanted to be. And, uh, and I remember calling my mom and saying, oh, mom, I'm not going to law school. And then, of course, there was a dead pause in the phone. I go, 
are you still there? And she's like, I'm not going to law school. I'm going to uh, start a new research company. And uh, we're going to do surveys and polling. And of course, my mother was like, well, what's that? <laughs> and I was trying to trying to explain it to her. And I said, you know, like the Gallup poll. She goes, no, you know, no, seriously, what is that kind of, what are you going to be doing? I said, it's like, I'm going to be a consultant. And then I rem remember my mother. So just think of the Greek mother saying, a consultant? You're going to be a consultant? I can't <laughs> tell your aunts and uncles that you're going to be a consultant. Why can't you be a teacher? Why can't you be a lawyer? You know, why can't you be an accountant? And then my mother goes, or they goes, is there a girl? She does the, is there a girl? And then, then she, of course, she also says, are you having any drug problems or is there anything that I don't know about? And it's like, no, mother, there's no, there's no uh, evil woman in my life and there's no drug problems or drinking problems or anything like that, but I just want to give it a try. And, uh, but uh, she was pretty, uh, I, I know she was pretty disappointed because she was worried. She didn't understand what I was doing and wasn't sure what the path was for that. And it was like, you know, from her perspective, it was like I wake up one day and I've thrown my dream of being a lawyer out the window. Yeah. And I understand your uncles were really helpful too. Yeah, no, they, well, they were very supportive, but they, they never, it took a while for them to get what I was doing. And, you know, for the longest time, I think for the first decade, you know, whenever I'd see my uncles at a family birthday and stuff like that, they'd, they'd say stuff like, you know, uh, I know you're a consultant, you're a consultant <laughs> but, you know, if you... If you, I think you'd be a great business person if you went into the restaurant business. You know, you'd be great at the front of the house where the cash <laughs> register is welcoming people. And, you know, I remember telling this story to someone and they said, well, you, were you offended? I said, no, I was no, not offended at all. I said, my aunts and uncles love me. When they said stuff like that, it's because they care about me and they thought that I could do well in another uh, another yeah. profession. Yeah, and, it's a compliment. Uh, yeah, it was. I considered it a compliment. I never took it as a slight uh, to have have to work in the restaurant industry or anything like that. And uh, but once I was on TV, then they kind of realized, hey, I think he's, I think he's doing okay because he's on TV. So that was kind of the the tipping point, Fred. So you you started the company with the name SES, not Nanos. Yeah. And I'm fascinated by why that change got made. Can you briefly tell us that story, Nick? Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, it kind of happened. I remember one time I was contacted, uh, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was doing a speech on free trade, and uh, his speechwriter, uh, Elian McDonald, wanted to include one of the stats from the SES Research, kind of my polling company, one of the stats in, in the in in the speech. I was very excited about that. I actually went to the speech that uh, Prime Minister Mulroney was at, and I was very excited about him mentioning it, and he got to the point, and then he said, you know, he was talking about the anniversary and all that stuff, he got to the point where I knew the poll was going to be mentioned, and then, and then, he, and then he said, uh, a recent survey, bye, and then I could see the Prime Minister pause, and he said, a polling firm says X percent of Canadians are in favor of free trade, yeah. and I was like, I was completely demoralized. And I went to this. I went to Elian McDonald afterwards, and I said, uh, "Ian, what happened?" He said, "You know, SES does not work in French." He said the prime minister paused when he saw it and did not want to make a mistake, so he did not say that. And uh, and that triggered a discussion in the firm and among my friends and colleagues and people that I trusted. And uh, you know, they all agreed that SES did not work in French. And then one said, I remember one of my friends said. Nanos, you've got a great last name. It's short, it's multilingual, it sounds like a tech uh, firm. Yeah. You should be Nanos Research. And uh, we did that and we haven't looked back. And it does sound technical. It does have a certain aura of authenticity. So It's easy to consume, which is good. Yeah, that's great. Now, I, I'm intrigued by your early career and I want to uh, hearken your memory back to 1988. Uh, there was a, a, an election in one of the Kingston area ridings where Flora McDonald, who'd been a cabinet minister in the Clark government and a cabinet minister in the Mulroney government and who was beloved by everybody, was being opposed by somebody named Peter Milliken. And your firm predicted that Milliken would win that election. 
Yeah. It's going out on a limb, Nick. Well, it was a big limb because no one uh, no one believed it. It's interesting, you know, we, we did the, we get hired to do the poll by the local news organization. And, and when we showed them the poll that showed that poor McDonald was going to lose, I think the reporter said, okay, so Nick, you're telling me that for McDonald, one of the most successful politicians in Canada, a senior cabinet minister, a role model for women who has no, uh, there's no controversy, no scandal. She's done nothing wrong. She's going to lose to, and I think they referred to Peter Milliken, and if Peter's watching this, please forgive. They said, a bookish liberal guy who's a lawyer. And it's like, is that what you're telling me, Nick? And I was like, that's what the numbers show. So they ended up running the poll because they paid for it. But I remember that night in 88, I'm sitting with my brother. And I remember I turned to him and said, John, we might be having the shortest career in polling <laughs> history tonight. Because, you know, I'll tell you, I wasn't even sure whether the polling was correct or not because it was so counter to popular wisdom. And Flora had not done anything wrong. Yeah. She was a distinguished politician with a great career of service to Canada and to Kingston, but the riding had changed. There were new people in the riding, people from Toronto. And she also, because she thought that she was gonna win, she didn't spend a lot of time. So, uh, so it worked out, but you know, the lesson to me was have blind faith in the numbers uh, that take yourself out of the equation and what you think could could have should have might have happened and just look at the numbers and and stick to that and that served me well over the last 30 years nick one of the things that you're respected for is that you do stick to the numbers you do limit yourself to the numbers um in an era slightly before you came to prominence there was a guy who i knew very well alan Gregg, who was canada's primary pollster with a firm called decima yep and Alan was flamboyant. Uh, some described him as a rock star, long hair, eloquent speaker, sort of cocky and buoyant. Um, how did you feel about going up against that reputation? Well, you know, the thing is, is Alan Gregg was a hero to many people, including myself. He was uh, an accomplished researcher. He was charismatic, smart, quick, witty, funny, all, you know, insightful. He had the whole package. He was the rock star pollster. And I, and I remember when I started off, I was thinking, well, I can't, there's no way that I can, there's only room for one rock star pollster, that rock star pollster and star is Alan Gregg. And I remember we were thinking about positioning for the firm. And then our position is like, what's the opposite of the star pollster? And then we said the opposite of that was the banker. So we were going to be more corporate. And we, as we would say, you go to the bank when you have big decisions to make. You go to the bank when you need help. You go to the bank when you want to make sure that your money is safe and that you prepare for the future. So we positioned ourselves as the bank that you can trust, kind of like the blue chip research firm that provides reliable advice that you can trust. And uh, so we went to the other, other end of the spectrum. And as a result, we're very careful in what we say and very meticulous in our work yeah and respected for that nick mm -hmm. we were uh, looking at a bit of a timeline uh, a moment ago and i want to skip ahead to 2004 uh, you started something that hadn't been done before that year and that was uh, nightly election tracking yeah what prompted you to do that and and what was the result of that well, you know, it's interesting. So, Fred, when you talk about nightly election tracking, that was done internally by each of the major parties. It was kind of like the secret numbers that only a handful of us operatives would know what the numbers were. Many times the party leaders didn't even know what their overnights, overnight numbers were. And uh, and it was very private. There's not, not, not nightly tracking in the public domain in Canada. So, we had decided that what we wanted to do was to pitch the concept of nightly tracking in the public domain where we would share all the information. And at that time, we had discussions with uh, the Cable Public Affairs Channel, CPAC, Peter Van Dusen, we call it Watson, and uh, had discussions with them. And we sold them on the idea of nightly tracking. And we were the, uh, we were the first firm to, to do the nightly tracking in Canada publicly. Mm -hmm. um, and that turned out to be very popular uh, because Canadians got to see 
kind of the cut and thrust of the campaign every day. I remember a lot of political folks would say, Nick, I love you and I hate you because I love you because I get to see your numbers every day, but I hate you because whenever we make a mistake, there's a nanos number out there that puts a spotlight on whether that's a potential problem or not. Right. So, so we kind of were first in that space. And uh, since 2004, we've done nightly tracking, uh, first for CPAC and now for the Globe and Mail and CTV News for every federal election uh, since then. Yeah. Now, I've been wanting to ask you about this question for about 14 years. In okay. 2006, you came within one-tenth of one percent of predicting the outcome for the major Canadian political parties in the 2006 election. Now, I can see getting it within one percent, Nick, but I've been dying to ask you, is there a little bit of luck involved in getting within one tenth of one percent? For sure. Yeah. Well, there's, you know what? There's, when it comes to something like that, it's like life. Hard work and luck. Yeah. Uh, count. Go right? like you, you could yeah. be the, you could be the most brilliant person in your field, but if you don't get a break, you'll, you'll never kind of excel. Or vice versa, you could be second rate, but be lucky. In that particular case, it's hard work and luck uh, at the same time. And we've had a pretty great, track record in federal elections over uh, over all of the elections that we've been in. But that was really the, uh, that was a great moment. That also proves to me that it is possible, to, that perfection is possible. Yeah. We talk about error and there is error, but it is mathematically possible to have a perfect election call. We're lucky that, I shouldn't say, see, we're lucky and fortunate because of our hard work, but also uh, luck that we happen to be the firm that had probably the best election call. I can't see what will ever be beaten in Canadian election history just because it was like 0.1% on all the major parties. And it really enhanced your firm's reputation. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, it's kind of it's, it's kind of weird because, you know, when, when my, the Nanos brothers were not exuberant fist pumping, it was like, wow, that's very humble. Actually, I was humbled by getting it so right in the same way that I'm humbled every time that we call an election uh, properly. But after that, it basically, uh, you know, what it shows is that good research and not just the research from our firm, but from our colleagues, good research is out there. And that uh, if you invest in uh, research and focus on the details, uh, you can have uh, exceptional results. Nick, your company has a number of offshoots or divisions, and, it, and I'm really interested in the, in the range of activities that you've gotten into. So there's a, a communications firm called Nanos Rutherford McKay. Tell us what that firm does. So that firm, uh, you know, true to our origins, it, uh, it focuses on communications, but it does a lot of communications audits, which means it evaluates the communications of a lot of uh, organizations. And uh, like a lot of things, I remember when we started off these offshoot kind of ventures, so to speak, I remember we thought, are we going to do everything internally? Are we going to outsource or what are we going to do? And uh, we kind of decided that uh, when it came to Nanos Research, you know, a company can, we thought, and it's our view, can only be world-class in one area. It's hard to say, we're world-class in 10 things. And uh, as a result, we've kind of worked on a model where we found people that we like to work with, in this case, John McKay and Dave Rutherford, uh, and my brother and I, uh, and we formed up the company, and uh, we have that as a compliment for, for our clients. You have a, another joint venture with an overseas company, with a German company. Tell us about that company and what it does. Yeah, that's Nanos DMAP. So that's uh, an analytics and uh, targeting company, and uh, DMAP is uh, top German pollster, they do the polling for ARD and for test DMAP, which is the equivalent of the CBC. And uh, they have some great mapping uh, services and targeting services and analytics. And it's like a lot of things. I hit it off with my business partners, Reinhard Schlinkert. We hit it off with Reinhardt. We kind of have similar worldviews. We're family people. We started our own firms. The culture between the firms are very similar. And we decided to strike up, strike up the venture and uh, and that's been uh, that's been a lot of fun. Where these two firms are in the future, who knows? But it's it's fun to work with great 
interesting people. Yeah. One of your other um, joint ventures uh, involves a, a, a firm that's pretty well known. That's Bloomberg. Yes. And I think there's a story about how that happened that our viewers might yeah. be interested in. Yeah. So the the Bloom our numbers our consumer confidence numbers get streamed to Bloomberg terminals every Monday around the world. Um, and we were doing a confidence index and uh, Bloomberg News was periodically reporting on the Nanos confidence index. And, uh, and we'd always talk about closer collaboration because uh, I had a lot of time for Bloomberg as a news organization, they're world-class. And uh, I remember one time Matt Winkler, who was the big boss, like the global executive editor of Bloomberg News, he helped found Bloomberg News with uh, Michael Bloomberg, was in coming to Toronto and the Bloom, and I guess when he does his tours, he says, hey, um, who should I meet? And somehow my name got on the list of people to meet. So they said, we're gonna recommend that you meet uh, Mr. Winkler. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting conversation. The first time, I think Fred, the only time where I received a call a week before I met Matt, uh, the meeting with Matt Winkler, from one of the people in his office, office, and they said, you're meeting with, uh, very seriously, you're meeting with Mr. Winkler. He's a very busy person. What do you want to talk about? Wow. So that he's prepared. Yeah. And I said, well, I've got an idea about, you know, we have a confidence index. I know Bloomberg wants to be more proactive in Canada. I said, I'd like to talk to him about partnering on the, uh, on the index. So a meeting happens. I show up, and uh, Matt Winkler comes in, as, as well as his number two who runs kind of the United States. And uh, I start the, I'm sure you've done this, a lot of other people is like, hello, my name is Nick Nanos. And then I get ready to do like the autopilot spiel on who I am. And Matt, Matt goes, I know who you are. I've read the file. You're the top dog in Canada. I hear you've got an idea. Tell me about it. So then I tell him about the, uh, about the index and uh, how well it's performed. And uh, I said, you know, we can co-brand it Bloomberg Nanos. And, uh, and then he, I could, there was a pause and I could see him thinking about that. And then he looked over to his colleague and he said, let's do it. Wow. As simple as that. And I was kind of floored. And, um, and then it was, kind of, it, was, it was kind of awkward and funny. I came out of the meeting and I remember telling colleagues in the Bloomberg, kind of the Ottawa Bureau, Theo from the Ottawa Bureau and Mike uh, from the uh, Toronto Bureau to say, guys, we're partners now. And they're like, what do you mean? Because like, like, Matt signed off. He, he gave approval for us to co-brand the Bloomberg Nanos Index. And then, uh, yeah, so, and the rest is uh, history. So we've had that partnership. It's been a great partnership for both organizations. And it's been a go-to resource every week, weekend, week. week How long have you been doing week. it? That's uh, now, I think, more than uh, six years that we've been uh, partners with, uh, with Bloomberg. So it's been a great partnership. Nick, your career is so varied and, and so uh, busy that there are some things I'm just going to want to touch on lightly, but there's a couple that, that really interest me, and that is that you are a research professor at the State University of New York in Buffalo. What are you doing there, Nick? You know, Fred, I thought you were going to say, you were very polite when you said varied. I thought you were going to say scattered, right? Because being a pollster, there are scatter plots. Anyway, so I said, oh, no, Fred's going to say scattered. Varied is very polite. So thank you very much for being polite. Um, yeah, I'm a, I've been a, a research, uh, I've been a professor at the State University of New York in Buffalo for well, now more than a decade. I'm a research professor, which means that uh, I only do research. Uh, I do not teach classes, but I have an appointment as a research professor. And uh, my project that I've been doing for now 14 years is a uh, tracking study of a thousand Canadians and a thousand Americans on the binational relationship on things like border security, national security, inspection of goods, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and it's, been, uh, it's been great uh, to do that. I've made a lot of very interesting friends. It's allowed me to kind of uh, learn more about the United States and uh, be more of a content expert on that front. And, uh, and it's a concrete project. We do the research and I also donate the research to the, uh, to the university. So that's open for any academics to use, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Nick, you're also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. 
Did you go there for a, a tenure there? Yeah, yeah, I did a, I did a residency for about four months. And, you know, my, uh, I talked to my wife. My wife and I are kind of an inseparable team. And uh, my wife, you know, I talked to my wife, Paul, and, and she's, she's got her own career. She's an assistant deputy minister in the federal government. She's, hey, Fred, if you want to talk to someone really smart, you should just stop this interview and get my wife to talk to you. But, um, and, you know, we talk about these opportunities. And I remember saying, you know, what do you think? And we have a family with four boys. And, and we talked about it. And she said, you know what? I can, for four months, I can cover for you. And we'll make it work. And uh, I did a, had an office at the Ronald Reagan building near the White House. It was a privilege to be part of the Wilson Center and to do research and uh, meet a whole bunch of other really interesting people in Washington, D.C. That'd be fascinating. You're also a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's collaboration on, uh, on energy. Um, tell us what you're doing there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really great project uh, with the University of Ottawa. They, uh, positive energy has to, has to do with trying to figure out how we square the circle between our environmental aspirations and energy policy. And I've been, um, I chair the advisory board for positive energy and I'm also a fellow there. Uh, but uh, we do a lot of uh, research trying to understand how Canadians feel about how we can achieve our environmental aspirations, but at the same time still make sure that we've got jobs. Yeah. So, uh, so I do that. As you can see, it's a very eclectic mix. And, uh, but I like these projects because they're important for the public domain. I can volunteer my contribution. I can add to the body of knowledge. And it kind of supports just a better Canada, period. It was interesting during the American federal election how polarizing the uh, the energy brief became in that election and, and how much misinformation there is about the impact of moving away from, uh, from the uh, petroleum-based yeah. energy. Well, you know, that's the, the, the sad part about where we're at in public discourse is the misinformation yeah. that's out there. And... Uh, and, and people in Canada, there are people in Canada and the United States that are susceptible to that kind of misinformation. It's not good, it's not good for society and it's not good for democracy, but it's the sad state of affairs that we're in right now. And just to, to, to sort of fill out the, the profile a little more, if, if, if that's needed, you're a fellow of the Marketing Research and Intelligence Association. And I understand that's the highest professional designation in the market research industry in Canada, and you also hold a certified management consulting designation. So you're, in addition to being a pollster, you're also a, a management consultant. Do you, do you do that on an ongoing active basis? Yeah, actually, I like uh, the CMC designation that I got, I quite liked and the training, the ongoing training related to that, uh, I have a lot of time for because it's about, it's, uh, it's about systematizing and standardizing best practices. So it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's a super designation to have. And I like the ongoing, uh, ongoing learning. As you can, you can see from all, you know, you said varied, I said scattered. You can see, I like to learn. Actually, that's the best part about my job is I'm an expert at what I do, but I learn, I learn about what people think, what people want, where things are going. And that's what really uh, makes work exciting for me and kind of keeps me going every day. You, uh... You, you have a pretty broad platform. Uh, you appear in The Economist, uh, which is my favorite magazine, by the way. Yeah, me too. Uh, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Reuters, The Guardian, BBC, all the major Canadian outlets. And you're the pollster of record for the Globe and Mail and CTV News. Just tell us what that means. Yeah, it sounds like you. I should have like epaulets with like stripes for <laughs> each... Yeah, one of these things. I think you've earned uh, that. Yeah, well, the thing is, is for uh, CTV and, and Globe, we've had a, a long-standing relationship. Um, we do the, the 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 signature stuff is the election where we do the nightly tracking. That's the big, mm -hmm. big beast. Uh, but beyond that, you know, it's uh, to the credit of uh, of both CTV News and uh, the Globe and Mail, their priority has not been about about measuring who's up and who's down every month. It's about putting spotlight on issues that are important to Canadians. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we do monthly public policy surveys for both CTV and the Globe on the big issues that Canadians care about so that we can kind of advance thoughtful dialogue 
And uh, that was a decision that they made. We support that and we, that's what we wanted because, you know, to, to kind of say, you know, under the L35, <laughs> under the C34, bingo, you know, like that's, there's not, there's only so much value in that. It's important during the election, but what's more important is putting a spotlight on what Canadians believe are important and the advice that they have for politicians in order to make Canada a better country. And that has a reciprocal sort of a spin-off in that it causes Canadians to be more interested in those issues because they're seeing what their friends and neighbors are saying and thinking. Yeah, I guess, you know, for those people that hate polls, it's kind of like the Buckley's cough syrup strategy. Yeah. Yeah. You might not like polls, yeah. but they work in terms of putting a spotlight and provoking discussion. Right. Uh, on right. Things. Because most time when people look at polls, they think of themselves. They think of, oh, most Canadians think the same way I do, or most Canadians don't think the same way that What's I do. What's wrong with them? Exactly. So <laughs> it's a it's a good point of uh, good point of reference to spark dialogue. And you have a weekly segment on CTV News Channel called Nanos on the Numbers, which profiles yep. the latest political and social and uh, and business trends. I'm always intrigued by who people's clients are, Nick, because I think it says a lot about uh, yep. about the business. And uh, just for our our uh, viewers. You um, you work for Staples and Bell Media and KPGM and uh, and you also do reputation and trademark litigation, which as a former lawyer interests me. Yeah. For people like Staples and Adidas and Pepsi Cola and Bodum and IMAX, uh, do, do you appear as an expert witness as to what the impact of uh, negative commentary is? Yeah. Well, actually, I'm pretty regularly called upon to be an expert witness, either to do research. Right. on a reputation issue or to critique the research. So okay. our stuff would be before the CRTC on a regulatory issue that someone right. might have, or it could even be a court case uh, where someone is being slandered. Um, you know, we did, we did a lot of work. Well, here's a good example. We did, uh, we did the foundational work. You remember Mahar Arar, the, the Arar inquiry, the, the person that was, uh, yeah wrongly charged and yep. held. So we did a pretty massive project for the government to estimate the damage to his reputation mm -hmm. of being uh, of, of being charged when he was innocent. And uh, so that included public opinion research, included media research. But, you know, the, we were the expert to say, okay, someone claims that they has been damaged to their reputation. And then we measured what the actual damage was. Fascinating. And, uh, that was a fun. That was a fun project. Yeah, that's intriguing. Yeah, Nick, you were named in 2017 by the Hill Times one of the 100 most influential people in government and politics in Canada. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, but I, I know you say all this stuff, Fred, but I don't think these things are. I don't think of them in terms of being exceptional. Yeah. Um, they just happen. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't take myself that seriously where I kind of have a big fat head, if you know what I mean. Like I go home, I spend time with my wife. I spend time with my kids. I like to watch soccer. I make yogurt. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll tell you what's more impressive is that I'm an expert. I, I expert at making yogurt. Wow. Uh, to me, that's more impressive than anything else. But yeah, we, we see these things and it was kind of, kind of, I, I, you know, I read it and it's like, I raise an eyebrow. I was like, Oh, well, that's interesting. And, yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, it just, I, I think it just speaks to the fact that uh, uh, the work is respected. Uh, we're fair in our analysis. Uh, we're ethical in our research, and we stick to our knitting. And I think that's basically what that is. A, is a, I want to touch on a couple of things, and, and our time is, is flying by, I'm afraid. But you do research that focuses on what you've described as supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms, which oh, yeah. seems like a longhand way of saying artificial intelligence. Yes, okay. it is artificial intelligence. So we've been using artificial intelligence in the shop and uh, it's been great. We've been writing our own uh, machine learning algorithms, supervised and unsupervised models. Um, and we've been using those to help us do uh, an analysis. But, you know, there's not blind faith because I'm a mathematician. There's not blind faith in the model. I'd always kind of say, Fred, that when the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence agree, run with it, run okay. with it fast. So it's all it, tested. 
Yeah, if the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence don't agree, pause. But, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, artificial intelligence is not replacing people's work. It's not like we have fewer employees as a result of it. It's changing people's work where they're doing less boring things and focusing on delivering value to clients. You did a, a project on the integration of social behavior and sentiment databases on a on a large scale, and I was I was interested in that as uh, as as to what the future application of that will be. You know, you know what, Fred? There are kind of like two camps. There's one camp that says polling is dead and irrelevant because of big data. We have all these transactions; we can see what people do. And then there are the other folks that say that uh, there's still a future for polling. I'm actually in the middle. I'm in the middle ground because I believe that the future of the research industry is to bring behavioral data like transactions and public opinion sentiment data on what people want together mm -hmm. because that's going to be a much more powerful paradigm. And I think polling on its own is not enough and the behavioral data of transactions, that is not enough. But we're looking at combining those two things because we really think that that's where the future is. You, uh, you wrote a book called The Age of Voter Rage, uh, which explored populist politics. Um, that's a topic that there's a lot of interest in uh, because of a certain uh, politician in the country <laughs> the south of us. Tell us, yeah. about, uh, tell us about the book and, and what your purpose was in writing that. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote the book back in 20, uh, 2016, right? I, and, uh, and, you know, it, it includes stuff on Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau and Emmanuel Macron and, and so forth. And, you know, the premise of the book is that there are actually similarities between a lot of these politicians yeah. uh, and that this populist phenomenon. So just think is, is fundamentally grounded in what I'll say, the fact that there are an increasing number of people that think that their kids will have a lower standard of living. Yes. And what does that mean for our society? If, if we, if, if, if we don't, if we think that our kids won't even be able to live in the same type of home that they grew up in. Right. And it's this whole idea of uh, declinism, but you know, this, this pop, this populism wave can be tapped into on the right or the left. It's not yeah. just about Donald Trump. Yeah. And that uh, Justin Trudeau tapped into populism in terms of his aspirations. Emmanuel Macron did. Nigel Farage and Donald Trump were more on the on the side that was a little more right wing than progressive. Right. Nick, we wouldn't do justice to your career if we didn't also talk about the service that you've done and the uh, philanthropy that you that you've oh. done. Uh, you were the uh, national president of the Marketing Research and Intelligence Association and presided over a lot of significant. Uh, uh, items there that I'd love to get into, but I don't think we have time. Uh, but you're also the past chair of the Board of Governors of Carleton. You mentioned that for those who aren't familiar with Carleton, like almost 30,000 students at that university now. 30,000 students, yeah. It's, yeah. Budget of yeah. close to $500 million. It's a uh, chairing the Board of Governors there is a big deal. It's a big, uh, well, it's a, it's a great school. And, you know, you know, it's kind of in retrospect, you know, the Carlton path is a lot like my personal path. So think Carlton was, Carlton was founded after the Second World War to help veterans get back into the economy yeah. and to help people integrate into the economy and have jobs. Yeah. So you know this in the same way that my family came after the Second World War, it's about building a positive future. It's sure. not about the past. It's not about entitlement. It's about a positive, forward look to make Canada a better place and to help people reach their full potential. And uh, so uh, Carleton is very, uh, a very dynamic school. It's uh, interdisciplinary, which I love, right? In terms of all yeah. engineering and architecture and computer science and business and, uh, and the arts and science. And I think that's why it's uh, such a great vibrant place. It's got a very bright, bright future. Nick, now that we've talked about you being a PhD candidate and the president of the board of uh of a of governors of a Canadian university, what kind of education did your parents have? Not much, you know, think my dad grew up, you know, my, my dad was a teenager during the war, second world war. So my dad had a grade four education. Yeah. Uh, you know, my mom didn't have even a high school education. Wow. 
And, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, one of the things you remember about your parents, I remember, you know, my dad being able to speak English, but he couldn't write English very well, but he was great at counting money. <laughs> he was very good at counting money and he was very good at math. Math is that kind of universal language. It doesn't that's matter true. where you come from. If you're good at math, that's very, uh, that's, that's very portable. So, but you know, one thing both of my parents believed, even though they only had, you know, nothing greater than a grade six education was that education was important. You know, my mom, um, you know, as a single mom drilled into me, go to school. If you go to school, you can have, get a job, you can live a good life, but you had to go to school. And she drilled that into my brother and I, and, uh, you know, it's kind of, I think it's an ironic twist that the son of immigrants with only a grade six education would be the chair of the board at one of Canada's major universities. And, uh, you know, again, the other thing is, is everybody's got a story. Like, I think if you looked at my resume, you might think that my parents were rich and very intellectual and highly educated. Well, the fact of the matter is they came as immigrants. Their English was uh, broken. And uh, but they made a good life and they built a good family. And it's a wonderful story, Nick. Uh, we have just a few seconds left, but tell us quickly about your wife and kids. We, we want to know about that. Oh, yeah. So, OK, my wife, Paul Abbe. So she's uh, her dad's from Quebec. Her mom's from Cape Breton. So we're kind of the perfect Canadian family. Right. It's kind of a uh, son of immigrants and a Cape Bretoner and Quebec. Like what else? What else are you missing? You've got the whole well, the angles there. covered. Yeah. And she's uh, an assistant deputy minister in the federal government. She's like an accomplished individual. She also has an MBA like me. Um, and uh, she's my partner and, my, you know, she's just everything. And we have four, uh, four boys. We call them the Flying Nanos Brothers, Fred. Wow. Yes. Good stuff. Nick, I'd love to talk to you further. I've really enjoyed this and I've followed your career with interest and it's a, it's a real treat for me to, uh, to get to know you, but uh, I'll come back and say thanks in a minute. But I do want to thank the, uh, the viewers who have joined us today. We appreciate it that you, uh, that you follow this program. We hope we're bringing to you uh, guests that both interest and, uh, and inform you and perhaps also inspire you. And I, I suspect that Nick Nano's story will do that for you. Thanks to our series sponsors, Bales Estichon Wealth Management. Thanks to our anonymous sponsor for this particular program. Uh, we also want to uh, thank the Midland Cultural Center, which, uh, which is uh, the uh, producer of this program. Thanks for the technical support by Rogers TV. If you've enjoyed this program, we'd love to have you go to the MCC Midland Cultural Center website and click on the donate button because the uh, center is is closed but continues to need your support nick thank you this has been such fun and such a wonderful life story it's great to join you and all your viewers thank you and to our viewers we'll see you next time thanks so much bye for now